There we go. Just because we have people absent. There we go. So, 4B. Once we even change number 9 to be a problem that we could do. Bless you. Here you go. Sorry for the delay. Any questions on the front? Okay, when we go to the back then, again, I ask that you thought about it before you just typed it in the calculator. Could you predict where you were going to get your first answer? That's why we sort of went to the back and said, okay, I don't want just an answer. I mean, I do, but I want, okay, when I hit that in, did I, was I predicting an answer on the first quadrant? Did I get a reference angle? Like when you did number, give me a negative cosine. Um, 
or a negative cotangent even. Number 29. When we did that one, did you realize that all of a sudden you got an answer in the second quadrant? Then you know that was going to happen. Could you predict it? I didn't know right away that you knew it was going to happen, but could you predict it? If you're starting to get to the point that you can predict where it was going to happen, then I had to find a reference angle, and then I had to put it in the other quadrant, then we're getting there. That's exciting, right? Or if you're just typing it in and like, poof, I got something, I got to work with it. That's what we're trying to get away from. Why is that happening? Well, that's still my job. I still have some work to do. But if you're being able to predict what's happening, then you're getting closer to me being able to do my job. Okay? But if you're just hitting buttons and like, like a magic eight ball, whoo, what do I get? Then you're sort of missing the point of us redoing this because we've done this two or three times now. Okay, so if, that, if, you, if all you do is push buttons and then deal with it, then I want you to go back and rethink them now that you have the right answers. How Could I have predicted it? Like I said, put a little check next to it. Put a little star next to it. If you got it right, put a happy face. That when I typed it in the calculator, ooh, I predicted that one right. I knew what my calculator was going to give me. I knew which quadrant it was going to pop it out in. Because you were never going to guess the third quadrant. That's where we're trying to grow to. Okay, so remember, that's why we talked about doing this, like for the third time. This is the third time we've seen this. You're good. I got you. If you've got questions today, you can just write a little note to Alexandra and she can ask me since she's lost her voice today. So the more stuff I give you, the more precise we can get on an answer. And we know the calculator is not ever going to, I still wonder why, the calculator is never going to give me an answer in the third quadrant. Why is that? Coming soon. Coming real soon, actually. Definitely a next week conversation.
Okay, any problems putting them in your calculator? And those of you that have finished it, how you know, like, it's a good feeling, like, can you make that pr prediction? So, like, when I look at one, we could take any of them. Um, I like to take a negative, like here. If I type this one in, I can predict now. This is going to give me an answer on the fourth quadrant. It's going to be negative. I'm going to make it positive to get a reference angle, and then I can put it anywhere I want. That's where I want you. So if you can sit there and say, mm hmm I know exactly what's happening with that. I don't know why that happens, but every time I have a sign that's negative, it's going to be in the third or fourth quadrant. I know it can't happen in the third quadrant, so I know what's going to happen every time. That's huge. Even if you can just tell me it's going to happen in the fourth quadrant, I'm pretty happy. We're getting there. Even if you don't know yet that it's going to end up being negative, that connection's not being made. That's still, we're almost all the way there. Why is it giving me a negative? Well, that's my job. I still have to show you what's going to happen, why that's coming out negative. Why it's not giving me all the way around to the fourth quadrant. Well, you kind of know that because it can't touch the third quadrant. If you really think about it because that third quadrant is still kind of forbidden so when I say it can't give you an answer in the third quadrant you've also start to put together that it can't go past the third quadrant that's why it has to go to the negative so it's not so tough to figure out that it's giving it to you in the in the fourth quadrant and it has to go negative We've grown enough since doing this the first two times to see, excuse me, why that's happening. So if you pick another one, like you take a, mm, let's take a positive one, a sign that's positive. Well, it's first and second quadrant. Well, it's going to give it to me in the first quadrant. It's going to give me a reference angle. And I don't even have my calculator sitting here that I'm typing it in. And as soon as you're able to do that, then the graphs are going to be easy. But you kind of have to pick that up so that you know where the graphs are going to be defined. And that's why we're plugging this back in our calculator before we get to the graphs. Because otherwise the graphs are going to be like, uh, I don't know where to graph this. Okay, so there's a purpose for me doing this and having you think through it before we actually get to the inverse functions. That's why we're still solving equations. Again, I always have a, I always have a reason for something that I'm doing. It's not just torturing you, because this is a little bit of torture, I feel like. Okay? Any questions? I'm just better at explaining to you my reasons. Go ahead, Savi. Number? 31? 30. 30, absolutely. So if I go to 30, okay, this one is my secant, and I can't type secant indirectly, so I have to change this to cosine. So I'm going to change this to cosine by taking its reciprocal, and then I'm going to type this in as 1 over negative 1 1.7172. So I have that there to study from. And my cosine is negative. So you can see I eliminated the two quadrants, and I know it can't give me an answer in the third quadrant, so I know it's going to give me an answer in the second quadrant, which means I'm not going to get a reference angle, right? So I'm going to go type it in. I know that I'm just going to get an answer. I'm going to get an answer between 90 and 180. So I'm going to do just that. Let me make sure I'm in degree mode, and I'm going to type in inverse cosine, and 1 divided by negative 1.7172 and what do you know the answer between 90 and 180 exactly what we thought so happy face for me and you because we predicted it right now for me to get it out down here in the third quadrant because the calculator is never going to do that I got to find a reference angle it actually gave me an answer so I'm going to subtract it from 180 to get that reference angle. So 180 minus that answer, and there's my cute little reference angle. So 54 degrees is my reference angle. 
I want to get it in the third quadrant, so now I'm going to go around 180 plus that reference angle to get between 180 and 270. So now I'm going to do 180 plus that answer, and there's my answer between 180 and 270, 234.384 degrees. Nice. And if you can do the same thing and say, I know that I'm going to get an answer because it's going to give it to me in the second quadrant, and in the second quadrant, I'm not going to get a reference angle. To me, that is huge. We've come a long ways from just typing stuff in the calculator and not understanding what's happening. The first time we did this, it was a mess because we didn't know what we were getting. Anything else? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, did our video work last time? No. Sorry. Then there's no video. I think our vi I think my computer was down last time. Okay, but it's up today. Okay, so let's check C. Where we're solving particular solutions. And we did not do 11 through 15. <coughs> and we're going to do U substitution today. So 11 through 15. And I think we'll just pick one of those to do. Um, I think I was going to do 11 in my notes in anyway. So we'll just do 11. I did not get to do any parts of it. First one that I had a domain restriction for was number seven. So it's kind of off here to the side, but I want you to see I did check my domain restriction, but nothing got thrown out. Jack, Keith didn't come back there at all, right? None of his stuff's been here? Okay. Just making sure he wasn't getting a picture taken or anything. And this is pi over 2, 2 pi over 3, 4 pi over 3, and 3 pi over 2 for number 10. Now, for 9 and 10, just because they were a little bit more challenging, I had to change my trig function goes back to what we did in the last unit. I can't have a sine and a cosine, so it was much easier to get rid of cosine. So cosine squared it is, sorry. And so I did substitution. So I'm still using those Pythagorean identities. They have not gone away. That formula sheet is still in use. Same thing here for number 10. It was easier to make the sine squared go away than try to get rid of the cosine. So like conjugate common denominator, use the, the 
identities, you know, change things to sine and cosine. All of that stuff is still there. I'm still trying to solve. I can just now work with both sides because I'm doing a solution. Go ahead. Yep. So seven, all I did was divide by three and I'm looking for where the tangent is negative one. And so where is the tangent negative one between zero and two pi? Well, it's in the second and third or second and fourth quadrant. So that's giving me three pi over four and seven pi over four. And all I have to do is figure out where the denominator is equal to zero. Well, this is really just tangent is sine over cosine. So I figured out where the cosine is equal to zero. Well, that is my pi over two and three pi over two. So if I had gotten pi over two or three pi over two, I would have had to throw them out. Well, I didn't get those, so I had nothing to throw out. And I don't often throw things out. I gave you one in the notes where I did have to throw a set out when we did that cotangent problem. I mean, I can give you one just as many as I can give you one that's not. But I have to check every time. Because the one time I don't check is the time that that's the time I got to throw it out. Okay, so we didn't do 11 through 15. We're going to do those today in class, so you don't have to copy down that answer. You're going to see them again. So 16. Seventeen. Seventeen, sorry, is down here. Let me slide it up a little bit. Sixteen had a domain restriction, and all I did for this one was go back and look at the problem we just talked about because it had a cosine, and then so I flipped it back over here and said, okay, what was my domain restriction for number seven? I didn't rerun it. I'd already rerun it on the page before. And 18 had the same exact domain restriction, and so did 19. So all three, all four of the problems on here that had a domain restriction were the same. So I went back and looked at number seven. None of these had a domain restriction where the sign was in the denominator. It just happened. It was not intentional. Okay, anything you want to talk about? Anything that you want me to talk through? Before we get into a multiple angle. Go ahead. Number nine. Absolutely. Okay, number nine. Okay, so if I go back down here for number nine, I'll talk you through it, and if you want me to rerun it, I'm happy to. Um, this is the one where I had two trig functions, and now you kind of see from the last unit why I don't want two trig functions, because I don't know what to do with this. So I took this cosine squared, because I could change it into sine. So I took cosine squared out and made it one minus sine squared. Then I could distribute. And once I got here, all I did was then combine like terms. So I had my negative 2 sine squared plus sine, and then 2 minus 1 gave me a positive 1. Then I have to, I have a trinomial. I think I'm going to have to factor. So I could have here either moved everything to the other side, or I honestly just divided everything by negative 1. Or I could have taken this whole thing and factored out a negative 1. would be the same thing. That negative one, either way, isn't going to give me any answers. So then I had this trinomial that I'm then going to factor. 
So that gives me my two sine x plus one and my sine of x minus one. I set this equal to zero and this equal to zero. And now I'm looking for where's the sine negative one and where is the sine positive one. And there's where I got my answer. So my sine is negative one half in third and fourth quadrant. That's my seven pi over six and my 11 pi over six. And of course, where is it positive one here at pi over two? No domain restrictions or anything. So done with my three answers, okay? Anything else? Okay, I'm gonna do my first multiple angle, um, and I'm gonna do uh, problem number 11, but I'm gonna do a little bit more with problem 11 than just what I'm gonna do on here. Because I feel like for the, and I can only do it with one problem, um, which is number 11, I want to do it a couple of different ways. And then once I show you the final way, that's how I'm going to run all of the rest of them. Okay, so I have a little tiny bit for your notes, and then we can run the rest of the problems on there. I will eventually run problem number 11 two different ways, so you won't have to go back and do number 11. But I don't have enough room on my worksheet to run 11 two different ways. So multiple angles. And we're going to start off with particular solutions, obviously. And then eventually we're going to work into general solutions. And I'm going to stick kind of right with your worksheet today because um, we're going to finish it. So I'm going to keep it between 0 and 2 pi. And I think on your worksheet it actually has 2 pi not included. So I'll stick with that so that we're not having to redo this problem. Uh, and number 11 says that we have the cosine of 2x is equal to 1. This is the only problem I can run and prove to you that what we use in calculus, U substitution, so we're going to definitely step well into Calc A today, actually works. Okay, because this particular problem has a formula that would work. Okay, so this is my favorite one because I can prove it. Any other multiple angle. So when I say multiple angle, that means that what I'm doing here with this angle has changed. So it could be a half, it could be a three, it could be a four, it could be anything. If I put a number out here, we just divide by it. But when this starts to change, that's when it becomes a multiple angle problem. And as you can see, if I look at like you know, number 15 on the homework, it has a one half. So it doesn't even have to be multiplied by something. It can be divided by something. We have a half angle formula, but I don't need it because I'm going to treat this problem the same. 14 is three times. Well, I don't have a formula for that one. So I have to use something else. Okay, uh, number 15 has two times. So it's similar to what I'm about to do, okay? And this one is a three times. So I, I can't even use a formula for this one. This is the only one. So if I take this problem, I could potentially take any of our formulas and I could change this. Because again, I'm going back to that formula sheet from the last unit. The first one that comes to mind is cosine squared x minus sine squared x, right? That's my favorite but I think it's useless. Because if I set that equal to one, I mean this factors, but it's only useful if my factors are equal to zero. That's a lot that I learned in algebra two. Agreed? So I think that formula is not very helpful, but I do have two other formulas. So I could say that cosine of a double angle is one minus two sine x equals one. Or I could use, what, 2 cosine squared x minus 1 is equal to 1. So this is just not useful in this problem. I mean, it's useful in other places, it's just not here. Agreed? And both of these work. That's kind of the cool part. Now, had this been a 3, I couldn't do this. Had this been a half, I couldn't do this. But we can solve it now. 
So eeny, meeny, miny, mo. do you care which one I use? Now, I'm going to use both of them, so it doesn't matter which one I start with. I might as well start here because I wrote this one first. So if I take negative 2 sine of x and I subtract 1, I get 0. Well, that's fun because now if I divide by 2, I still get 0. And I just want to know what the sine is 0 between 0 and 2 pi. So where is the sine 0 between 0 and 2 pi? zero and pi, and if it was included, I would also say two pi, right? But I can't, so I'm gonna say that x is zero and pi, done. We solved our first multiple angle problem. And honestly, the only one that I can solve with a formula. Okay, so we go to use the other formula. Here, I would take cosine squared of x, I would add one, and get two, agreed, and then divide by two, and I'd get one. And then I'm gonna take the square root, and when we do, I would get plus and minus square roots of one, which is one. And then I'm gonna ask the same unit circle question, where is the cosine plus and minus one? <coughs> can't say 2 pi because it's not included, but I want to really bad. But it also works at pi, right? No domain restrictions because you better believe I'm thinking domain restrictions because you're giving me quadrantal answers. But there's no domain restrictions, right? So right now, I don't really see the need to teach you something new because we have formulas. And it doesn't matter which one I use, they both work, right? Until I look at the worksheet and I go, well, I can't do this unless I give you that problem. As a matter of fact, and you don't necessarily need to write this down because I'm not going to do anything with it. It's up to you. If I give you the sine of 2x equals 1, I can't do it. Because I know a formula for this, so do you. You know that this is 2 sine x cosine x, and the reason you don't need to copy it down is, Elizabeth, you good? is because I can't do anything with that. I mean, I can divide by two, but if I have sine x, cosine x, I get one half, then what do I do? It's not like this is a sine squared or a cosine squared. That was Sarah's question earlier. I can't change them. Right? They weren't like the problems that we had on our homework where, like here, I could change them. I mean, sine and cosine are basic. Agreed? It's not set equal to zero. I mean, if it was set equal to zero, I could figure out where sine was zero and cosine was zero. I can't do anything. Would you agree? So even that formula, which we know so well, I can't use to solve. I gotta have something else. And that is where U substitution starts. Now, U substitution, this is not the only place you use it. U substitution comes in any time, so I just wanna make this go away. Any time I wanna get rid of something in my problem and I wanna make it easier for me to do, U substitution enters our problem. So it's gonna enter often through calculus, through physics, wherever we wanna use it. Okay, so I just am making my problem more simplified so that I can do the problem. So if I'm gonna go back up, I'm gonna do the same problem and I gotta get these same answers. That's my proof for you today that U substitution works. It's lovely. You can talk to anybody in higher level math past you and how much they use U substitution. And when I'm not recording, I'll show you why I think they call it U-substitution. Mathematically, I think we call it U-substitution because U is not used for anything else in math. Like if you come up with a formula like distance equals rate times time, D is used, R is used, T is used. T is used for time all the time. Parametrics, okay? We use other variables for things, you know, like X, Y, Z, A, B, C. Pythagorean theorem, even though he was a cheater, a stealer, whatever, we already know that story. 
We don't pick it, call it a substitution, because that variable is used for other things. You, not used for much. I also think it's kind of a pun because it's all about you or me, because I'm doing the problem, right? I also think there's another reason it's a you, off camera. So I'm going to take this problem. I don't want to get fired today, basically, is what you just heard. And I'm going to take this part out, bless you, and I'm going to replace it. Literally, it's called U substitution. I'm going to put U in place of that part. That's the multiple angle part, or the half angle, or the triple angle, or whatever you want it to be. And now, if I put that in as U, that's easy. with a little tweak because this whole problem was defined that said that X had a domain restriction. If you remember the very first problem we did, I said X had like the element of, well, I'm not writing the element, X had a domain restriction from zero to two pi, not included. Well, now I need a domain restriction for you. That's not hard because u is now equal to 2 times x. Well, if x is from 0 to 2 pi, well, 2 times that is simply from, I'm going to multiply by 2. If it's half, I'll take half of it. If it's 3 times, I'll do 3 times it. So now if I'm going to take 2 times that to get my restriction for u, then I'm going to go from 0 to 4 pi. Oh, i got to do more work if I change this one to u. Okay, so now if I solve this problem with respect to U, then I have to use that domain restriction because that domain restriction is all about, you see, U. But it's easy to solve now. So if I solve for U, I still have the same answers because I want to know where U is 1. So U is 1 from 0 to 4 pi here at 0, agreed? But you see I can't pick up pi because there's where it's negative 1. But the next place it would be would be 2 pi and I got to go all the way up to 4 pi. The next place would be 4 pi, oh but in this case 4 pi is not included because that's around a bracket. Okay, well you just gave me answers all about you. I gave you a problem all about X. <laughs> See, mathematicians are not quite right in the head. I'd really know more about you than I would about my X. <laughs> some of you get it, some of you have no idea yet. Okay, but I gotta figure out about X. So I'm going to substitute this back in and say that 2x is actually equal to 0 and 2 pi. Actually, I don't work that hard for it. Hold on. That's way too much work. I just go like this. 2x and now i got to solve for x. So how in the world am I going to get x by itself? And look at that. Same answers. Now we can solve anything. We can solve any multiple angle that's out there. As a matter of fact, you're going to be able to find derivatives, antiderivatives, anything you want to with U substitution. You can factor crazy things. You can do all kinds of things because you can replace anything you want to with U. Hmm. So we just did problem number 11. So let's take a look at problem number 12. Today of things disappearing. 12. Use substitution.
done in notes. By the way, no domain restrictions, right? For this problem? No. How about 12? Any domain restrictions for this one? No, because these have their own domain restrictions. Every single problem has its own domain restrictions. It's like two problems in one. Okay, we have a new set of issues. U is now 3x. Changes my domain, changes everything. Okay, x was 0 to 2 pi. Boring, but that's what the direction said on the paper. I don't love it, but I'm going to do it. So I'm going to go ahead and find my new restriction for u, which is the same as 3x. Well, you're going to figure out pretty quick, whatever this is, you're going to do that domain. Well, if it's 3x, I'm going to multiply it by 3. So I'm going to go from 0 to 6 pi, and in this case, we're not including it because this told me to. Don't love it, but that's what I'm going to do. Now we're ready to solve this problem because I can take this cosine of u substitution and it's almost exactly as the same problem. So again, where is the cosine equal to 1? 0, 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, but I can't include it, right? Okay. And, I don't think I gave you one of these. There you go. <laughs> now, I'm ready to substitute it back. So I just say, well, u is equal to 3x. Solve for u. Ugh, solve for x. And I didn't have a formula that I could have done that one with. That's the only way I can do it. Now, on the last one, because I'd shown it to you two other ways, I didn't really check it. I don't have to check it. It's going to work. But I feel like, as an honors class, I should prove to you that it works. You don't have to prove it. If you do the math right, it works. But if I put zero in here, what's three times zero? Zero. What's the cosine of zero? One. Duh. You already told me that. If I put two-thirds in here, what's two, or two pi over three, sorry. What's two pi over three times three? Well, they cancel. Two pi. Well, I'm not even going to ask you what the cosine of two pi is, because you already told me is one. If I put four pi over three in here, four pi over three times three, well, duh, that's four pi. And I'm not even going to ask you what the cosine of 4 pi is because you've already told me that it's 1. That's how we got there to begin with. It works. But I feel like you need to see that because otherwise you're just getting answers. They really do work every single time. But you don't have to check them because you got them. That's how you got that answer. So plugging them back in is just a big circle. Okay. Okay. 13. A little bit more challenging, but I think a whole lot more fun because now it's a half. So u is x over 2. That's fun on the domain because x is from 0 to 2 pi. So u is x over 2. So what's your new domain? You've got less to do. That's less work. Okay, go ahead and finish that one. Go ahead and do 13 and 15. Uh, 14 has its own beast. Because so far, no domain restrictions, right? I 
think you can see why 14 has a little bit of a beast. It's got a domain restriction. And every single one of them has its own domain restriction. You can't go back to number seven and use that domain restriction five times. Every single, like a triple angle would have a different restriction than a double angle, than a half angle, than a fourth angle, four times an angle, etc. So you don't want to do five different domain restrictions because you would have ten problems to do. So go ahead and try 13 and 15, see if you're comfortable, then we'll run a domain restriction problem. And you have to say, if calc A is like this, and you're handling it okay, bring it on. You're ready for calculus. Calculus is not a dirty word. It's not a scary word. You're getting more and more ready for calculus. U substitution is definitely a calculus concept. Mm So when you're talking about like even signing up for Calc AB, you should be like, okay, I can handle this. And we use use substitution so many different places. This is just one of them. Anytime I don't like something, I always think unlike. I don't like, I unlike it. I put in a U. Maybe that's where the U came from. I don't think so, but we'll go with that. I want to tell you, so I'm going to pause the video. I need to talk about the domain restriction. Okay, so here, let's first run the problem. Let's say that u is 3x. And then let's go ahead and change our domain. So, of course, x, again, is still from 0 to 2 pi. This is not fun. Because now, when I do my new restriction, when I say tangent of u is negative 1, I have to find answers under u. And what's my new restriction? 0 to, you're going to have a bunch of answers. Let's find our answers first, and then we'll run our domain restriction. Bless you. So I have to go around this thing three times. We're just finding coterminal angles, right? So from 3 pi over 4, if I go around again, I'm really just adding 8 pi over 4, right? So that would give me 11 pi over 4. And if I go around again, that would be 19 pi over 4. So these three are the same. 
why not go ahead and find all three of them? And if I'm at seven pi over four, if I go around again, that's eight pi over four, right? That's two pi. So what's seven pi over four plus eight pi over four? 15 pi over four plus another eight pi over four would give me 23 pi over four, right? And four goes into 23 less than six times. So here's two pi, four pi, six pi. So I've got to make it easier for me to find them. I'm not going to find this one, go around once, then find this one. I'm going to find all three of these, then all three of these. Okay, I still have to find x. I'm not going to divide by three, that's for sure. Instead, we're going to multiply by one-third. Reducing as you can. And of course the problem is we have a domain restriction. So my domain restriction here is the tangent of 3x is really the sine of 3x over the cosine of 3x. I can't go back and look at problem number 7 because number 7 was just the cosine of x. I have to run my domain restriction of 3x. The cool part is I've already done the u substitution, but I have to run every single problem that's different. Now, if I had a different 3x, I could do that, but now this is where this is equal to zero. We haven't done that. We've done it equal to one. We've done it equal to, well, that's 2x. We've done 3x equal to one up here with number 12, but we've not done zero. Well, I already know that u is gonna be equal to 3x, so I'm really running, my domain restriction is where the cosine of u is equal to zero. I already know I've got to run it from 0 to 6 pi. All that's already done at the top. And away we go. So where is the cosine 0? So the first one we're going to get is pi over 2. 3 pi over 2. There's my first rotation. I'm going to do the same thing I did above. So pi over 2, I'm going to add 4 pi over 2. So 5 pi over 2, add again, I get 9 pi over 2. 3 pi over 2, if I add 4 pi over 2, oh wait, they're all odds. 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, the next one would have been 11. And what do you know? 2 goes into 11 less than 6. Still not done, because that's all about you. <laughs> That's sarcasm for me. I don't think that's what great mathematicians were thinking. I gotta still find it for 3x. So I'm gonna multiply by a third. And this is the hard part, is that you're really doing two complete problems when you have a domain restriction for a multiple angle. All the others, I only have two domain restrictions. And they're quadrantals. This isn't a quadrantal. This is but as soon as I solve for x, I get pi over 6. That's not a quadrantal. But it's also not up here. So I don't have to throw that one away. Then I get 3, oh, pi over 2. There's the quadrantal. But it's not up here. I could just be throwing one of them away. I might not throw any of them away. I have no clue yet. But I got to check. 5 pi over 6 is not a quadrantal, you see, because with a multiple angle, you just never know. 7 pi over 6, not up here. 
And the fact that we have a, a pi over 12 and a pi over 6, they could easily reduce and give me the same angle. Doesn't look like it's going to happen. 9 pi over, this reduces to 3 pi over 2. There's the quadrantal popping back up. And then 11 pi over 6. It doesn't look like I'm reducing anything or I'm throwing anything out. But I would not have known that if I had not checked. <coughs> And like I said, it could just make me throw one answer away. Could make me throw them all away. I mean, that'd be awesome. At least then it's worth my while. But in this case, I threw nothing away. And that happens a lot. I often don't throw anything away. But I don't know if I don't check. And at least out of all those problems, I only had one that I had to run a domain restriction. You're not going to get five problems with five domain restrictions. Because really then, I gave you six, or I gave you ten problems to do the problem and its domain restriction. Easy enough? Okay, let's do some general solutions now that we finished particular. And you don't have any other homework on that quite yet. So, multiple angles, um, solving equations with general solutions. I don't have tons of notes for you today. I think I have about seven questions. Yep, seven. Because you know everything. I mean, you know all the notes. You know, change things to sine and cosine. You know, get a common denominator. You know, factor. You know, conjugates. You know, like we did one on the homework. If you've got two trig functions, Try to change it to one trig function. You've done some practice. What's going to be different now is how do I try, how do I handle general solutions? So I'm going to give you a couple of the weird ones and see if we can handle the general solutions. That's the part that's new. I want them all. You're going to know that they're different right away. Um, I'll take one that you might have even had on the homework. 2 sine of theta minus 1. No domain restriction. And then next class, we'll deal with multiple angles again. I want them all. I don't even tell you where to look. I want them all. Well, i got to get sine alone. So I think we're going to add one. And then what are we going to do? Divide by two. And I suspect most of you can do that in one step. So we're right back to our unit circle. Now I want them all. So if I want the sign to be positive, of course, I'm in the first and second quadrant. And here's where you're going to see me graph or draw all of them. I'm not, I don't have much success here without drawing them because I want to try to link these together. So if I know that I'm in the first and second quadrant and my sign is a half, well, I know that that's a long X and a short Y. So I know that I'm here at pi over 6. And, of course, the other one over here is at... 5 pi over 6, you're right. I would like to link these two together. But just by sight, I know that I can't. Now, technically, I could have named this, I always go in the positive direction. I could have named it seven, negative 7 pi over 6 and negative 11 pi over 6, but I'm always going to do the positives. You could do either one. There's no rule that says you have to name the positives. But if I could link them together, then the distance between them would be the same, just like asymptotes when we linked them together with graphs. We would say, well, here's the first one, and then how far is it to the next one? You notice k is back as an integer. Okay, well, I can see that on here, that if I even just look because I drew them, that distance is not the same as that distance. So I can't link these together. So the only way that I'm going to be able to list these, now some of them are going to be able to be linked together, is I'm going to state the first one just like I would an asymptote. I'm going to say pi over 6, and then I want this one forever. So I want this one all the way around, this one all the way around, all the way around, all the way around. Oh, wait, I could go this way. All the way around, all the way around, all the way around. I literally sound like a broken record, and I'm going in a circle. Okay, records like, surprise, some of you even know what records are. All the way around, all the way around, 
All the way around. They're coming back around, though. Ha ah, there's your second joke. All the way around. All the way around. So how do I do that? How far around is it? 2 pi. So I can say plus. I can say minus. 2 pi k. Now, I often write plus or minus. You don't have to because k is an integer. We've had this conversation already. If k is positive, I go in the positive direction. If k is negative, I go in the negative direction. So you really only have to have one. If k is a whole number, you have to have both. That's kind of why I still do both. I once had a college professor that k was always a whole number, and he made you write both plus and minus. But as long as k is an integer, all AP tests, doesn't make a bit of difference. Okay? Then I have to name the other one. I could say 5 pi over 6. I could say negative 7 pi over 6. Doesn't matter to me. I'm always going to be the positive. What kind of a positive person? Sarcastic, but positive. So I'm going to say 5 pi over 6 plus, again, all the way around, 2 pi k. That's all you really have to do. Every now and then I throw a comma in there. If I've been teaching algebra 2 all day, you'll see me throw braces in there. But I don't have to. That's just habit from last year, okay? Because I'm used to having square brackets and round brackets and braces, and I can't turn it off, okay? Especially for your class, because I just taught Algebra 2 before you, okay? So it depends upon when I do my homework. What's my mindset? But I don't have to. Okay, that's sort of the basic. I can't tie them together, okay? Let's see if we can get some that we can tie together. So four cosine squared x minus three is equal to zero. Again, just trying to show you some of the different cases, and maybe I'll get up to one of my favorite ones today. You had one of my favorite ones on your homework for particular solutions. So you're going to add 3, and you're going to, and then you're going to square root. Like that part, you totally know what you're doing. So you're going to get the cosine of x is equal to plus or minus square root of 3 over 2. And again, I, like we started trig, the very first day of trig, I said, if you draw it, you can solve it. Here we are. I think that was like October. And here we are. End of February. Leap day. If you had Miss Morton last year, you might want to stop by and see her. Today's her birthday. She turned 10. Because she has a birthday every four years. You can figure out the math on that one. But today's her 10th birthday. So we've been celebrating Miss Morton today. She has happy birthday 10 in her classroom. So most of, or you should all be older than Ms. Morton as far as birthdays. I'm pretty sure she's older than you in years, but by birthdays, you're older than her, unless you're also a leap year baby. Okay, we're talking about a pi over six reference angle again. So pi over 6, 5 pi over 6, 7 pi over 6, and 11 pi over 6. Well, this time I don't have to say pi over 6 plus 2 pi k, 5 pi over 6 plus 2 pi k, 7 pi over 6 plus 2 pi k, blah, 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 two, blah, 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 blah. No, I'm not going to do that. But I don't think this distance is the same as this distance. I can see that. So can you. That's why I draw them. This, not the same as this. If this was pizza, this piece, not equal to this piece. Not fair. Okay? But I do think that I can tie some of them together. Anytime I'm in the first and third quadrant, same reference angle, or cross quadrants, same reference angle, you can tie them together. Because how far is it from pi over 6 to 7 pi over 6? Pi. pi. So these can be tied together. It's always going to be pi if they're the same reference angle. So I can say pi over 6 
plus 5K. Or I could have said 7 pi over 6 plus 5K. I don't care. I always start with the first one. So when you're going to check your homework against <coughs> me, just like asymptotes, I make the physics people happy. I start with the smallest one closest to zero or closest to the x-axis, and I name that first one. Then I could talk about these two. How far are they from each other? Pi again. And I could, funny enough, I could really make the physics people unhappy. Couldn't I call this one negative pi over 6? That's what your calculator would do, wouldn't it? Okay, but I try to be positive. So I'll pick the 5 pi over 6. It also makes physics happy. But I don't have to. I could call it negative pi over 6. What a good multiple choice question. I could call it 5 pi over 6 plus pi k. I could call it 11 pi over 6 plus pi k. I could call it negative pi over 6 plus pi. Oops, forgot my k. Doesn't matter. Call it what you want. I'm probably going to write this one if you want to check your answers against me because it does make the math and the science go well together. That's the engineering side. It doesn't really matter. I could write a plus. I could write a minus. I could write a plus and minus. Look at all the choices you have. It's sickening. Okay? When people say there's just one answer in math, no, there's not. Okay? I love it when, like, you know, English says, don't you love grading math? There's just one answer. Not when you teach the upper levels. Yes, in algebra, X is two. They're very easy to grade, but not here. You could write other things. I guess you could go around four or five times, and I'm probably going to mark it wrong because you annoy me, but you're probably right. Okay? But I'm going to mark it wrong just because. You had too much time on your hands. Okay, number three. Three tangent of x is equal to negative three. I might only do four with you today. I'll do my favorite one next. How many of you I catch? 3 pi over 4, 7 pi over 4? Agreed? So 3 pi over 4 plus pi k? Did you check your domain restriction? Shame. Tisk, tisk, tisk. You might be right, but did you check it? If you did, good for you. If you didn't, shame, shame, shame. Sine of x over cosine of x. Oh, I could go look at number seven, right, from our last homework, because it's the same domain restriction. Where is the cosine zero? Pi over two and. 3 pi over 2. Once I run it once, I'm not going to run it again. Well, that's not my answers. We're good. I think I have time for two more. 14. I'll save my favorite one for last. Secant of x minus 1 is equal to 0. This one just annoys me. Then I'll run my favorite. So we'll run 5.
I don't know secant so well, so I'm going to change it to cosine, take its reciprocal. Oh, it has a domain restriction. I'm not going to get caught with that again. But the domain restriction is cosine zero. So C up here. Can't have those two. That's okay. Because where is the cosine one? Zero pi? No. Zero and two pi. So it's got to go all the way around to get another answer. So how am I going to write my answer? 2 pi k. Can I write 0 plus? Don't you dare. That's like me asking you how old you are. 16 plus 0. 15 plus 0. Then I'm going to write on your paper that you got a 95 times 0. Because if zero is that important, I can put it times zero. Okay, just so we're equal on how we use zero. We don't write plus, we don't write times zero. Okay, last one, my favorite. Number five. This I look hard for these. You've done this problem before. It might have been cosine and cosecant. I'll give you one that has the same restriction. Still the same restriction as this one can't be the same quadrantal, so you don't have to run it again. So domain restriction, still pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, so we don't have to go through all that. I love this question. I can work hard to find these kind of questions. I sit and dream about them. Which drives my husband crazy. I remember last time we talked about this question, I said, great SAT strategy, because you can cross multiply like a butterfly. And it was like 80, or 67 degrees, I wish it was 80. 67 degrees cross multiply like a butterfly. And we get two cosine squared equals one. If you can write a proportion on SAT test, you probably can do it. That and solving a system of equations from algebra one probably 120 points right now. Just doing those two skills. Of course we take the square root pi over 4, 3 pi over 4. Oh this is lovely. I love this problem. And if I don't draw it, I won't catch it. Because how far is it from pi over 4 to 3 pi over 4? Pi over 2, and I think 2 pi over 4 first, because you're reducing it, good for you. And then from here to here, if I subtract these, 2 pi over 4 again, pi over 2, 2 pi over 4, 2 pi over 4, they all link together. So if you write pi over 4 plus 2 pi, blah, 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 pi over 2 pi k, pi over, no! Name the first one. Pi over 4 plus, how far is it to the next one? That's my favorite. They all link together. You can't beat that. That's when it's awesome. Okay, 4D coming your way. We have class again Monday. Don't forget Monday and Wednesday, Tuesday, you get a free day. Maybe a quiz on Wednesday. What I'm planning. You have the front and the back of 4D, all of 4D, for those of you that don't hear everything I say. Just 4D.